Oh, good morning. Um, this morning, I will uh, talk about some new research. Uh, th- this is research they're very proud of because I had to buy it on Amazon. Um, we're going to talk about who might be our allies in this topsy turvy world, who might be our enemies, the wrong path, and the right path, as far as I can as far as I can uh, as far as I can see it. W. Edwards Deming, who was absolutely one of the top gurus in management education, <clears throat> was, was, you know, holding forth at one of these companies, and people were gathered around him, you know, as here's, this, here's the guru of quality circles. Some of you might remember, remember those kinds of things. And one, one person said, probably somebody like me when I was younger, why do we pay you so much to tell us things we already know? And he says, I wouldn't be here if you did them. So I might be telling you something you already know, but it's good stuff to hear again. You know, it's good, it's good encouragement uh, to hear again. So let me just start with a, a short prayer before we get started. Father, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts conform to your will and to your word. In Christ's name, amen. So let's get on with this research. I'm going to use <clears throat> a, very old, uh, a very old way of doing this. For those of you who are listening online, the front, the front row here is 20 seats. It, it's, it's not, it's 21, but um, and we're going to pretend it's 20 seats. And I'm going to just use this as a gauge just to give you a, a physical idea of what's, what, uh, what, what this research is saying. I'm going to go down here. So if this row represents 100% of all the people surveyed, and this is a a number, it's it's a Christian survey. Um, uh, The pastors within the survey was 1,000 pastors. Statistically, that's that's a pretty good number. Statistically, 6%, that's one chair out of all of these, 6% of Catholic churches have a biblical worldview. What's a worldview? Well, it's how you look at the world. How do you think about dealing with your neighbors? How do you think about dealing with the person sitting next to you here in church? How do you deal with customers and clients? How do you deal with getting pulled over for speeding? I don't know, just something random in my head. You know, how do you, how do you deal with it? How do you look through? How do you bring up your children? It's part of your worldview. What is just the obvious right thing to do? And if you say, well, the obvious right thing to do is this or that, that's part of your worldview. It's the lens through which you look at the world. And the research shows that 5 or well, 6%, so it's this chair and an armrest, of, Catholic, of Catholics, Catholic churches, have a biblical worldview. 94% of Catholic churches do not have a biblical worldview. And you can say all you want about Mary worship and all that kind of stuff. But they do have Christ at the core. But not in what they do. Let's see if we can do better than that. I, I, I'm, 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 I can move to the second chair here of black churches that have a biblical worldview. I have to stay here for the number of Christian adults in church that have a biblical worldview. that That can't be right. I can move over to this next armrest for youth pastors that have a biblical worldview. Peter, that leaves... 88% 88% that do not have a biblical worldview, these are the youth pastors? 
youth, pastors. I don't have to move a muscle when we get to teaching pastors. Assistant and associate pastors, I can start to move up a few. They're right about here. Churches in general, only 40%, 37% have a biblical worldview. The majority is still out there. Senior pastors. I mean, if you're a senior pastor, right? 41%. Evangelical pastors. One, two, three, four, five. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Evangelical pastors, 51% have a biblical world view. Seven in ten evangelicals do not believe Jesus was God. No, Peter, you got that wrong. I can hear Max in the back. Is he, last time I came up with these horror st- statistics, Max said, now wait a minute, have you, were you sure about it? I went, I went off and I thought, maybe I haven't seen the research right. I, I had, but... You're an evangelical, but you don't believe that Jesus was God? Isn't that kind of in the name, Christian? Eighty percent of Christians are syncretists. What's a syncretist? Well, this is a crisis beyond all crises. How can you go to church again with all that used to mean? You would go to church and you would get a certain, for lack of a better word, product. These people, they have a, they have a playbook, right? And and then they teach and they preach from that. No. A syncretist is someone who takes a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and they heard something in the Bible for them. They also sort of heard something at the Anglican Church. And, you know, Mary probably has a role in, in should have a role in my prayers. And, and hey, you know, bad karma. <laughs> uh, and they incorporate these things, and you're actually creating for yourself a different religion. Now, Peter, yeah, I've said karma before. Are you telling me that, you know, I'm going to hell? I'll let you figure that out. 80%. You know a syncretist. A syncretist might be sitting in your chair right now. There are a lot of slippery slopes out there. And as the world goes down the drain, one might be tempted to seek allies. Allies against the rainbow fruitcake division out there that is driving, don't laugh because they're winning and we're not. This woke, critical race theory, uh, it, it, it's beyond what you could imagine. If you know, if, if you look back ten years, you couldn't have imagined it. So where are, are our allies? That's the research. By the way, I read th- things like the Christian Post, and I read these things. It is unalloyed, unmitigated, endless, negative posts. Don't don't read it. I'll, I'll do that, and then I'll do a sermon on it, so you don't have to. But, I mean, it, it, it's just endless. It's sexual scandal, sexual scandal, transgender bishop, gay bishop, married gay bishop, it, it, on and on and on. I'm part of the Anglican Church. We just had the Lambeth Conference. This is the big conference, yeah? The whole commonwealth, the old commonwealth of the UK comes to Lambeth Palace, where the, our archbishop is. And... And, and they talk about these, these big things. We are going down straight to hell on every 
single issue. We have nothing. So all of this stuff here, Israel, what I did here on the front row, all of that is reflected in the church I'm in. And we don't talk about it. And our pastor talks about Jesus being the great listener. And we need to listen to people when they come in. I'm not against listening. But there are more pressing things banging at the door of the church. Who are our allies? Well, one guy that, that if, you're a, if you're a YouTube person uh, is, is a fellow by the name of Jordan Peterson. You may have seen him on CNN. He's a, he's a clinical psychologist. He used to teach at the University of Toronto. Uh, like, uh, unlike me, um, he left because he was kind of blacklisted. But he left to go make a bunch of money online. <laughs> uh, I was just blacklisted. Um, but for the same kind of reasons. You know, he didn't want to have this compelled speech. He wanted to talk about what is truth. And he got booted out. Well, maybe, maybe this is an ally of ours. In some recent posts, he did an appeal to Muslims. That's what it's called, appeal to Muslims. And he gets in there and he says, Muslims, people of the Abrahamic faith. Okay. People of the Abrahamic faith. Sunnis. Team up with a Shia. It's another sect. That would already be remarkable. Muslims, get, get to know a Christian. You know, reach out across the divide. Muslims, go, go engage with the Jews. You, can, you know where he's coming. Abrahamic faith, you got the Ten Commandments in, 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 in common. You, know, you, know, you can kind of see uniting in common value systems to push back the woke, green LGBTQ agenda. Similarly, he came out with a video to Christians, and that's what it's called. <laughs> a plea to Christians. And man, this got my blood going. I was ready to go. I was ready to fix bayonets. Yeah? Um, well, I was ready to fix bayonets and charge. He said, stand up to wokeness in the church. Quote, invite the young men back. Young men? I would say men, but anyway. Invo invite the young men back. These young men who are, the, who are the focus of so much woke culture. Feminism and Me Too and LGBTQ and men whose play is too aggressive. Whose, whose assertiveness is violence. And whose desire to conquer and accomplish is the heart of the oppressive patriarchy. He says, help them to take a stand. A better life for you. A better life for your wife, your children, your community, your country. Quote, call them to the highest purpose of their life. Ask more, not less. Man, I am ready. I'm going over the trench edge. I am ready to charge the machine guns. Okay, good point. Good point. For you young men out there too, my aunt told me a story of this last week. She said when I met, when I met uh, Peter, you know, he wasn't one of the boys that went to church in order to date me. He was going to church on his own anyway. And that's what I wanted. He was taking that leadership position. He wasn't just going to church so that he could impress me. Hint, hint to you young men out there when you go off to university. Be the one that gets up in the morning, even if you've had a rough night, and go to church. It's not my church. Go to church. Be the example. Ask more, not less of yourself. Oh, I love it. But Jordan Peterson is not a Christian. He dabbles in Christianity. He's fascinated by it. He wrote a whole book on it. He is the true enemy of the woke culture. So is the enemy of my enemy, my friend. And that is the title of this sermon. The enemy of my enemy. 
Jordan Peterson, Douglas Murray, homosexual guy who writes about the collapse of civilization and that kind of thing. Ben Shapiro, Jewish chap online with, I think, three times more uh, views than all of CNN. Are the Masons our friends? My father was a 33rd degree Scottish Rite Mason. Are the Muslims our friends? I had some very good Muslim friends when I was in the Middle East. Are Republicans our friends? Are Libertarians our friends? Is the National Rifle Association our friend? Some examples of the enemy of my enemy is my friend might be, oh, the Mujahideen against the Soviets in 1980. And so who were we friendly with? We were friendly with the Mujahideen. And we kicked those Russians right out of Afghanistan. How'd that turn out? The Soviets were attacked by their German allies. The Soviets were allied with the Germans. They both invaded Poland. Why didn't we declare war against them? Well, rehashing history there. But once Germany attacked uh, uh, the Soviet Union, Churchill was quoted as saying, If Hitler invaded hell... I would make at least a favorable reference to the devil in the House of Commons. This is taking the enemy of my enemy as my friend to an extreme. But, you know, we thought we were done with that in 1989 or 1991. And now we have Ukraine and we're paying at least a a couple months ago $30,000 for a, you know, transporting stuff from China to the United States in these containers. The U.S. supported the Iraqis in the Iran-Iraq war as a strategic response to the anti-American revolution in Iran. I don't need to say anything more about that. And even in the office, maybe you watched The Office here in the United States, Dwight had a funny line. He said, Jim is my enemy. But it turns out that Jim is also his own worst enemy. And the enemy of my enemy is my friend, so Jim is actually my friend. But because he's his own worst enemy, the enemy of my friend is my enemy, so actually Jim is my enemy. But, and of course, it's an infinite loop of contradictions. It's a slippery slope. It might sound right, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, but it is so often wrong. Naturally, on single issues, you know, I mean, not everyone in the Republican Party is a Christian or an atheist or a Muslim or a Hindu or whatever. On, on certain issues, we can get behind and we can, and, and we can get behind certain things. But the issue is that if you're a Muslim or a Jew or an atheist or a Christian, you're not doing it for the same reason. My problem with it is that it's pragmatic. It's expedient. The fallout may feel distant. It feels safe to do it that way. A couple of years ago, I gave a sermon called The World, the Flesh, and the Devil. Surrounded on all sides, you surrounded by yourself and the world and the devil. To ally oneself with the world is a fleshly response, and the world, which at this juncture is reigned and ruled by the devil. So no matter how tempting it is to reach out to our Muslim friends to combat the insane woke movement, it is a reach out to ultimate untruth. And this is where those 80% of Christians are. They're syncretists. This is a smorgasbord for you Hoosiers. That's all you can eat. It's a smorgasbord of, of values and religions and creeds and concepts and philosophy. It's karma, it's agnosticism, it's Marianism, it's mysticism, it's deism. But exactly what you believe is important. If you're one of those 70% of evangelicals that doesn't really think that Jesus was God, you are not a Christian. You are not saved. Oh, how can you say that? You're so critical. You're so... Yeah, but that's how it is. And we are living in a world that is that way. Things are on or they are off. 
We live in a very digital, binary world. But we don't want to do that. It's gotten into our thoughts. So what are, we, what are we supposed to do? Well, here's my advice. Go to church, reach out, especially to like-minded Christians, but reevaluate where you are. What are you doing? Are you a syncretist? You incorporated a little bit of that? You know, you read the, about the Hebrew roots movement. Has anybody read about that? Getting back to the Hebrew stuff, and maybe we should do, maybe we should do Bible forum on Saturday, and maybe we should, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, follow the 613 Mosaic laws and that kind of thing. I was just, just bring it in. You know, it couldn't hurt. It's a little extra on top, a little extra good works and law on top. Recenter yourself on what you know to be truth. Concealed carry guns are not truth. Low taxes are not truth. Conservative Muslims who support the Ten Commandments don't understand them in truth. So what do you do? Well, one measure of intelligence is knowing what to do when you don't know what to do. So what would you do? You'd reach for your Bible. And you might go to Acts 17, 11. We're going to do a little bit of Bible, uh, Bible rummaging today. So that's on page 1623 of your companion Bible. Acts 17, 11, the last book of the Old Testament. <laughs> I just couldn't wait to make that joke. Now the Berean Jews were of a more noble character than those in Thessalonica. I was just in, in Thessaloniki, and I'm, I'm now I feel a little bit native. They say Saloniki. They don't say that first part, so I'm going to say it like the natives do. In Saloniki. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Reach for what we know is true. Acts 17.11, I think that should, should have been. Reach for what you know is true. Uncomfortable as it may feel, difficult as it is to follow, it is difficult to follow this stuff. Even if you don't have same-sex attraction, it's difficult to follow the Bible because it talks about anger. Anybody have trouble with anger? It's a sin. Difficult as it is to follow, distant as it sometimes is from our daily thoughts, the Word of God is in your hands literally now at this moment. That is how the Bible is referred to by Muslims. It is... Mena uh, Kadei or something like that. Um, they refer to this as the book that is between the hands of the Christians. On the basis of this book, the Quran says you should judge whether or not what Allah says is true in the Quran. How's that to put a hole in your own ship? And so I Google. And I look, and old Barna and his colleagues who did this research that I started off with made a brave effort. They put in the back of their research paper, they put a bunch of different Bible verses, and they said, you know, go get stuck in. Just kind of like I did. Go get stuck into these things. So I'm looking online. I find from the Anglican Church. What did the Anglican Church say? They said, read this week by week. It bears repeating and memorizing he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. He shall deliver you from the pe perilous pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers. You shall not be afraid by the terror of night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the COVID that walks in darkness. Well, that's when the Anglican church came out and said, in all Anglican churches, this is the, this is the um, reading that you should give to your people to help them get through COVID. This is official Anglican doctrine coming out and saying this is what you should read. 
nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. And this is one of the reasons why it's called the soldier's psalm. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come to near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you. No plague shall come near your dwelling. That's what my Bible says. You just going to throw that out? Nope. We're going to rightly divide. For those of you online, not really up on right division, do we go to Paul, right? We go to Paul, who is the apostle to the Gentiles, which is why he fought with Peter. And the first part of what Paul writes is pretty much in line with what you might read in John or Acts or any other, Peter, those kind of things. But when we get into books like Timothy and Philippians and Colossians and um, and, and Ephesians and, and, uh, and Philippians. Did I say, did I say Philippians? Philippians. Um, here's where we can really start to ground ourselves. If we're going off to school at Purdue soon, yeah, and you need an anchor, you, you know, you need to just take an anchor and just grapple on to something. What are you going to grapple on to? What are you going to hold? What's going to keep you, keep you in this in this tornado, absolute tornado of woke culture. What's going to keep you grounded? Well, let's go to the Scriptures that are not only for us, but they're to us and about us. Let's start with Philippians. Let's go to page 1776 in your companion Bible. We're going to look at five different, different places in, in the Bible here. Um, and this is just an exercise. I, I, I really miss this in, in our churches, that we have a Bible on our lap and we're going to go into it. We're going to turn a page. We're going to go there. We're going to see it with our eyes. We're going to hear it. And, and I don't know, there's just something about absorbing the Word of God rather than having somebody tell you what to think about it. Philippians 2, 12 to 13. Wherefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The message is get stuck in. Get stuck in. Do not leave this to Sunday's. Because the syncretist in you will win. The compromiser in you will win. No, no, let me take that back. The syncretist in me wins. The compromiser in me wins. And I don't want that to be the case with you. 2 Timothy 2, 3 and 4 on page 1810 of your companion Bible. I'm going to make this a little bit more readable English on a couple words here, so give me that leeway. Page 1810. 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. Thou therefore endure hardness. Timothy's having trouble here. Timothy's having trouble dealing with the, heart, with the problems, and he's, he's getting pushback, and he's... You know, these are encouragement letters to Timothy. Endure the hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. If you are allergic to blood and soldiers and warfare and the sword of the Spirit, you're in the wrong religion. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ, no man that wars, no man that fights, entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Man, that has been a really important phrase to me. That he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You focus, in the, in the in New International Version, it talks about focusing on your commander. Don't look out there. 
All that, man, I'll tell you, and I know some of you have said, I've stopped listening to the news. Well, good for you. You know, don't look at CNN or at least try to bring it down a little bit. Um, looking out there, look at your commander. Where do we look at our commander? In the book between your hands. Thinking biblically about everything so that you can be humble, so that you can suffer as a soldier for Christ, you are promised suffering. If you are not humble, then you will think you deserve good stuff for all of your work. I read the Bible today. I prayed. Everything should be fine. Oh, no, I'm suffering. And I said something. And my son, who said, I'm against abortion in his class and was nearly kicked out of school. Let me say that again. He expressed the legal opinion that abortion was wrong in a, in, in a discussion about abortion in a high school and was nearly expelled from school. If you're not humble, you're going to think you deserve more. To Timothy 4, 3 and 4, it's just a couple pages over, page 18, 13 in your companion Bible. To Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. I, this is really familiar to you, I'm sure. For the time will come when they have, will not endure sound doctrine. Sound doctrine? We're so far past sound doctrine, we don't know what a woman is. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. I, I mean, and you, they'll put up some goofy person on television and their professor this or doctor that and I I've told you many times in here the only thing you need to get a doctorate is a little a little you got to be a little bit nuts you have to have a lot of time and money and anybody can go out there and these people are getting their doctorates in women's studies and it's just a fake. It's just fake stuff. But they're on, on, they're on the TV, and they've got a doctorate, and everybody's listening. You think, well, we'll listen to them too. You know, they're people. We'll listen. No, if they got on there with a Nazi armband, you'd be like, oh, oh no, oh, we won't listen to that person. It's worse than a Nazi armband. Marxism has killed millions, and it's what's at the core of LGBTQ feminism critical race theory. It's about slicing and dicing you up into white males who can't do anything else but be aggressive and patriarchal and horrible to black lesbian females. And that's how they start slicing and dicing you up and you're in that box and you will stay there because that's who you are and that's how you act. And if you have a little bit more than I do, you got it because you cheated or you stole or you're evil or you have too much power. So avoid the temptation to water down your faith and to team up with the world. The Bible is replete with characters trying to move or modify God's plans along, jolly God's plans along, Adam, Abraham and Sarai, Lot, Samson, Peter, just to name a few. Turn, it says, turn to the truth. What, what is truth? It's in your hands. Page 1783, Colossians 2.8. And as I was reading this again this morning, I had to include verses 9 and 10. You just start reading this stuff and you think, it's all so good. I know we can't read everything. Colossians 2, verses 8 to 10 on page 1783 of your companion Bible. Beware, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. The New International Version has high-sounding nonsense. 
Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and high-sounding nonsense. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's a whole study on the Trinity. That's a, such a nice, nice one. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. And those are the people we're fighting against. Principalities and powers. The message here is to we are to be in the world and not of the world. And any philosophy other than that of Christ will lead you, lead you astray. The philosophy of the Masons, the philosophy of the Republican Party. Some of you said, well, I think one way for Christ and another way for the world. Is that okay? Is that a slippery slope? I was talking to someone else. They said, well, at our company, we, we don't do a lot of this LGBTQ stuff. You know, we fly the, we fly the rainbow flag, but, we, we, you know, it, it's, it's not a big deal. We had a, we had a session where these people would, you know, kind of come and tell their stories. And I went to that because there was free pizza. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad reason. But I will say you shouldn't listen to them. Because we're listening in our kindergartens to men in dresses who are reading little books about, well, you can choose which gender you want to. You can choose which sex you want to be. Let's listen to these people. Again, if, if, those, if, if they said, well, the Nazi party is down in the cafeteria and they just want to share their philosophy with us and they got free pizza... Oh, well, might as well go. None of you would be there, right? No one would be there. Well, maybe someone was really hungry. And then, you know, you would get the jokes in the office all the rest of the week, you know, and people would go goose-stepping by your, by your office, saluting you. Hey, good morning, Inger. <laughs> you would never do it. Ephesians 6, this is the second to last one, page 1770 in your companion Bible. I, can I just reiterate, it's so hard. When I lived in the Middle East, it's so hard not to start to incorporate other religions into what you think. My friends were deeply committed Muslims. They prayed five times a day. Ah, they said, you know, we're, we're all sort of, you know, coming from Abraham. Be our brother. It's so tempting. So tempting. Be our brother. L listen to us. Be allied with us. You know, we have more in common than we have in different, than we have uh, indifference. Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That person who is in the cafeteria talking about their journey from being a woman into being a man. We're not wrestling with that person we have two lesbian ladies that live just two doors down. I, mean, I, I, could, just, I, could, I could pitch a baseball just whoop, like that into their backyard. They, they're very close to us. I said to the kids, what should you do when you see these people? They kind of looked at me like, oh, is a trick question. I said, you should mock them and throw things at them. Well, they weren't down with that. I said, no, no. They engage in a certain thing. We're not against those people. We're not out here to get those people. Those are not our enemies. Our enemies are not flesh and blood, but they are principalities and powers. And even if your neighbor is the pointy end of those principalities and powers, that's what you're warring against. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Much of what is said here in the Bible for is illegal today. It is illegal 
and it's being recorded and put on the internet. Oh, but it'll all, it'll be okay. I hope so. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. This is the belt of truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. This is the principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness. All the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword, the only offensive weapon, by the way, in the armory. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, which is in your hands. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching. I'm very bad at this. Watching. Pray and watch. See what happens. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. The woke want you to leave it behind. Vody Bauckham, one of my favorite preachers, he's a Baptist Calvinist. Yeah, go, go figure that out. Anyway, but he's great. He's great. And he tells the story. He said, it's as if two knights come up to each other. You know, they put their helmets on. They got the whole armor of God on. And there you are with the, 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 the word, the sword of the Spirit. There you are. And, the other, and, and you go up to that knight and you say, I'm here with the sword of the Spirit and I'm going to run you through. And the other knight says, I do not believe in thy sword. And you say, well, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a sword, and it'll, it'll, it'll poke you, it'll puncture you, it'll, it'll hurt you. I do not believe that it will do that. So what do we do? And this is the problem with apologists. I include myself. We take our sword, and we sheathe it. And we say, well, look over here. You know, in metallurgy, or in astronomy, or whatever the, the apologist has gone out and reached out and tried to find some evidence for God and then work their way back to the Bible. Over here in metallurgy, we find that you know, this metal, and when it cools down, it's very hard, and we can sharpen it, and I poke you in the ribs, it, it'll make a hole in you. So you should, you, should really, you should really kind of worry about this sword that I have. He says, no, don't go through all that. Stick him with it. Stick him with the sword of the Spirit. It won't work. They don't care. They don't believe it. But, but it's true. It's true. Use your Bible. Use the sword. of the, It's your only offensive weapon. Otherwise, you're just playing defense the whole time. Last one. Colossians 3. 17. It's on page 1785. Colossians 3, verse 17. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. I would like to read that whole section of 1 to 17. It's just fantastic. And then it goes into wives submit to your husband or something like that. But we'll leave that out. But Colossians 3 1 to 17. Wow, that's a beautiful one. If you want to memorize something, Psalm 91, go ahead and memorize it if you like. It's for us, it's for our learning. But if you want something you can take, you want some, some nice baggage, a little bit of the sword of the Spirit that you can take with you, man, Colossians 3, 1 to 17 is pretty unbeatable. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, so alliances with the world and the flesh and the devil will never lead us to fit into the will of God. You're in boot camp. It's not supposed to be easy. Your promised suffering. 
but you've got armor and you've got the truth and you've got a sword and you've got a helmet you have a breastplate you get what you need do what you need to do in this life to praise God, to provide and protect for your family, to show love to others, support your brothers and sisters in Christ. But never hook your wagon to Freud, or Peterson, or Shapiro, or Islam, or Republicans, or the Supreme Court. These are not friends, in quotes. They are maybe temporary collaborators. Last point, I'll leave you with three points. One, keep your eyes and ears fixed on your commander, Christ Jesus. Two, puncture the adversary with the sword of the Spirit. Take it out and use it. I'm not really sure how to do it. Great, you can start now. The old Chinese proverb, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time to plant a tree is right now. I'm not really good with it. And I'm going to go off to college. I'm going to go off to another high school. I'm going to go here. I have another job. I, I, you know, start doing it now. Puncture the adversary with the sword of the Spirit and skip the metallurgy lessons. And the last one, run the race. Christ's race. Growing in the knowledge and grace of Him so that you can manifest the fruits of the Spirit and experience the peace that passes understanding. Let me close in prayer, and then I'll take any questions or comments that uh, you may have. Heavenly Father, this is our closing prayer that our love may abound more and more in knowledge, in truth, in the depth of insight in your word that we may run the race of life, that we may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus, to the glory and praise of God. And all this we do pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Any questions? That was, I should have, Roger, I should have started out with, and now for something completely different. Um, from last week, where we had this fantastic exegesis for those of you who weren't here. Any questions or comments? I'll share something that may benefit some of you, but being in the sales and on the road quite a bit, in the past, uh, sometimes people would ask me, do you carry a weapon? I said, I have a weapon stronger than anything you can provide. He said, really? What's that? I carry my Bible. I carry the Word of God. I have this case I carry it so it's conceal and carry. (laughs) Soon you might need a permit for that. Well, absolutely, and what a great way to open open up a discussion about it. Even if they say, you're a lunatic. You know, ask him a question. A lunatic. What, 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 what's your definition of a lunatic? What's a, how many lunatics have you met? Can I tell you why I'm a lunatic? I, I, just, had a, I just had a young chap um, who bought a computer off of me, and we started talking about Jordan Peterson, of all people. I said, well, I find him a little bit problematic because, you know, he gets into, the, he gets into all kinds of stuff, and he dabbles in Christianity. He finds it really interesting. He just says, well, it's not, it's not that it's true. It's meta-true. I mean, talk about slippery slopes. So, you know, he, 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 I said, but I, I had a little, little trouble with Jordan Peterson because he gets kind of close to the fire and then he backs off and he, he goes in, in kind of strange directions. And, so, and we just started talking about this. And he said, well, can I, can I come to your church this Sunday? So I picked my jaw off of the ground. Yeah, this doesn't happen very often. And... Uh, he came to the. He he, he came just in the uh, this cra- this weird chance encounter, you know. And you start talking about this, and and you start bringing out, you know, this is what the Bible says. It's not what Jordan Peterson says, as brilliant as he is, and as much as I like him. Here's what the sword of the spirit, right? just, you know, just like one of those little olive prickers, just 
just poke him with it. And he thought, hey, I'm interested in that. And he came to church, and then when he heard we were having a men's evening, he said, well, can I come to the men's evening? Said, come on, man. You're welcome. Any other comments or questions? One comment that I might have is uh, in, in using that sword, the scripture doesn't demand any real success. Right. It's just use it. Yep. Yeah. And I have instances uh, in my life uh, where years, years later, the evidence came back that the sword had been used. And it might be it was just a word here or there. Yeah. But it's sharp. It penetrates. And you don't have to know the success of it it's just use it and uh, i have instances with my father uh, for example that uh, used the sword and 25 years later a man came to know the lord so yeah thank you peter yes my pleasure have a lovely sunday all of you see you all next week